starting the 3.30 talk. Anybody would like to come in about remote observatory? Our final speaker this afternoon is Jerry Hubble. Is it Hubble or Hubble? Hubble. Hubble. Just, yep. Like the telescope. Just like the telescope, yep. Who is... Uh, Spelling is slightly different. Who is going to talk to us about the Mark Slade Remote Observatory of the uh, Rappahannock uh, Astronomical Astronomy, Society. Astronomy Club. Right. And he's also an engineering director at Explore Scientific, which I guess provided a lot of the hardware and... It was yeah, his design work right. involved. Um, this, uh, this came because he and uh, Dr. Wasyuda worked together on the observatory, and uh, they very graciously both came to speak to us this, af this afternoon or today. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Jerry Hubble. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate it. I appreciate the invite to come talk. Uh, I've given a few talks at NEEF. Uh, on a couple things, but uh, we're here to talk about the observatory we built over the last year and a half. And uh, so these are just some pictures on the, uh, of the observatory. I'll be showing some more pictures, and you can go to the next slide. <coughs> a little bit about, about myself. I am the Director of Electrical Engineering for Explore Scientific. Uh, I also am a retired uh, electrical engineer, uh, instrumentation and controls uh, at the Nuclear uh, Utility Dominion. And I'm also, uh, my title for the uh, observatory is Assistant Observatory Director. That's my role in the observatory. And I'm also uh, part of, uh, one on the staff of the ALPO. I'm a uh, Lunar Topographical Studies Assistant Coordinator. So if you have any lunar images, please submit them to me uh, for study, and we can get them uh, published in the Lunar Observer. All right, next slide. I've also wrote uh, these two books. Uh, you may have seen them. I've got some available if you're interested in looking at them uh, for sale, so I'll provide those at the end. You can come talk to me about that. Um, all right, next slide. All right, the uh, facility is located in Wilderness, Virginia, which is west of Fredericksburg. Uh, about 15 miles, uh, if you're familiar with where that is. Fredericksburg is halfway between Richmond and Washington on the I-95 corridor. And uh, basically, it's in Myron's backyard is where we have it located. And I'm about five miles from the location, so I get, I'm close enough to take care of things, but far enough to demonstrate the remote capabilities of the system. Um, and it's named, this, this facility is named after one of our uh, long-term members of the Rappahannock Astronomy Club named Mark Slade. You all may know him, may not. But uh, he was going to build a, this observatory. He, his estate donated a lot of the equipment where we built the observatory with, and uh, most specifically, the, we had a 12-inch LX200 Mead smith cassegrain grain. We have a 6-foot Technical Innovations Dome. And a, and a Davis weather system that we use, uh, have used in the observatory. So his estate uh, donated this equipment to us, so we decided we would build the observatory for Mark and name it after him. So, all right, next. All right, we, we have basically the purpose of the observatory is a training system for astrophotographers and also uh, we're doing, some, I'm doing some science work. I'm, uh, minor Planet Observer, I obtained the Minor Planet uh, Center code for the observatory uh, last October. And uh, we also have, we got four uh, observers that are in training, uh, remote training, to, to run the observatory remotely. And we have, uh, well, four active observers and two astronomers in training. So we're, we're rolling up, we're, we're slowly got everything going on the system. And I also, since uh, we've installed some Explore Scientific equipment, which I'll talk about. I use it as a test platform for our uh, control system and other things that we're developing. Next slide. Uh, we formed a commission to, to manage the, tels the observatory, and these are the ma members of the um, commission. Uh, we manage the budget and the facility maintenance 
uh, also. Um, next slide. All right, so here's some pictures. Um, on the left is the 12-inch Mead LX200 that we had installed originally. That's the one that Mark Slade's estate had donated. Um, hopefully you can see that, and you can see the dome up above, the six-foot dome. And then in the middle is the current instrument we have, which is a six-inch uh, Explore Scientific refractor uh, with an 80-millimeter with refractor on top of that as a wide-field camera system. Uh, right now we have an S-Big SD2000 camera on the system, on the main instrument. And then on the, on the right you can see the, the dome and the weather station that we have. Next. Um, so this goes over the few things that we have installed in the system. Uh, the six-foot dome, you know, the, the refractor. And we have a G11 mount, uh, Lozmandy G11 mount, which we s explore cells with the PMC-8 control system on it. And we also have a, uh, the telescope drive master uh, drive control uh, drive corrector, uh, which uses a high resolution encoder on the right ascension axis. The, uh, so like I said, the primary sensor is the S-Big SD2000 camera. It's about 10 years old, but it works great. We have a filter wheel on there that has uh, a few filters, the regular RGB filters and luminance, and we also have a, a 200 line per millimeter spectral grading on there. We do spectra measurement, you know, we can acquire spectra from stars. Um, and then the secondary instrument has a QHY 163C camera on it, the 80 millimeter scope. Uh, it's, a, it's a new camera, it's a very nice camera, 16 megapixel. So, all right, next. Some of the other things we have is a moonlight two and a half inch precision focuser on the system, on the main instrument. Uh, we have a digital logging web power switch, which is really nice uh, to power the, the whole facility. We can power it completely down and back up over the internet uh, as a separate uh, connection. Uh, we use, um, we have a high resolution or the high performance GPS receiver uh, with an accurate time reference. We use this program NMEA time, which is an excellent program for managing your GPS. All right, next. Um, so some of the software we use, Maxim DL and Cart to Seal um, are basically the first two uh, programs we use. And then we have Astrometrica and Registax for doing processing of images and measurements. Uh, we use the ASCOM platform uh, for our connections to our instruments and the NMEA time time GPS time reference program. Um, and then we, we have a standard sidereal clock display along with our real-time clock display. Um, the nice thing about the GPS time reference, we, we, we have, uh, it's got a control loop that runs on GPS time and sets your PC every 30 seconds and it keeps it to within one millisecond of the, G of the GPS clock from the satellite. So, all right, next. <coughs> so here's a couple more pictures of the instrument. Uh, you can see there's no dew shield on the instrument because that dome, six foot, is barely enough. It barely fits. This is about the biggest refractor you could, you could fit in here, and that's a, um, it's an F8 refractor, so you can see we're kind of tight in there. This is when we had the QHY camera on, on the system. And then the other one that shows the uh, S-Big ST2000 uh, camera on it with the 80-millimeter uh, scope on top. So also, you can see here, um, that's the high-resolution encoder on the RA axis for the telescope drive master. All right, next. Oh, this is the focuser. This is the moonlight focuser. That's the stepper motor control the, that controls the focuser. It's very precise. It's a four micron per step positioner, so it's very, very good focuser. All right, so when we started this project, um, one of the things, I, I made some general notes about what you want to have, you know, having a per permanent observing facility provides a huge number of benefits. I'm sure some of you know that. You've probably got your own observatories. 
But it's so much better. I spent uh, three to four years doing the uh, portable system with full-blown astrophotography, including doing calibrations and everything. And setting up and tearing down took an hour each. You know, I did that over 200 times um, when I start, started my uh, career in this area in astrophotography. And after that point, that's when I uh, had the opportunity to write my books after I had gone through all that process and learned over a three to four year period what was involved. So having your observatory, though, is so nice. You can turn it on. Five minutes, you'll be up and running. You know, do your calibration frames after sunset. And then you're ready to image for several hours as long as the skies are good, you know. Uh, the so if you have an opportunity to build an observatory, do it because it'll help you maintain your passion for this uh, hobby. I know it's tough when you always um, have a portable system and you want to get into this, especially if you go into the science area. Uh, it's really nice to have a permanent facility. Uh, next. Um, so there's, there's common themes uh, with small telescope observatories. They're all fairly sa the same pretty much, uh, depending on, you know, on we're talking small facilities for telescopes going from, I don't know, four inch refractor up to uh, 16 inch, um, you know, cast a grain or a reflector. I don't, some people build observatories for their jobs, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I know that uh, one guy we have in Culpeper, he's got a big roll-off roof observatory. That's as, probably as big as this room, but he's got a 30-inch obsession, do obsession dob in there So with a couple other scopes. So. Yeah, why do you go from the 12 to 6? 12 to 6? Oh, one of the things we uh, found with the, uh, with the Mead 12-inch on the Lozmendi mount, it was, we had some issues uh, with it, and we were, were kind of, were crunched for some cash for the observatory. So we decided after, after running with that telescope, that telescope we had was th 23 years old. So the performance was good. Uh, we had problems with uh, image shift and focus, you know, the, the full course focus. And we had a moonlight focuser on it so we could very precisely focus with it. But we had, uh, flexure problems with the system and we decided well we'll go ahead and sell that and then I had this six inch refractor that was available I've had it for about five or six years so I said well we we can install this uh, refractor uh, the other thing is that since um, Explore Scientific got involved with the observatory and we we've donated the use of the G11 Scott Roberts, who's our president, wanted to be able to showcase our equipment in the observatory also. So that's what another reason we went to the six inch refractor. So we could uh, talk about using our equipment in an observatory environment. Um, so next. Um, all right, so if you're familiar with observatories, you know there's performance requirements required, you know, what it needs to do for the telescope system. Um, you know, rapid temperature equalization is a big one, depending on the size of your optics. You want wind protection, of course, you know. You want to be able to lock it up and have a facility that, you know, if you have twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment, you want a secure building. So that's what the uh, building really provides for you. Uh, and it doesn't have to cost a huge amount of money depending on how much sweat equity you want to put into the system. Um, so the other thing is that what, what I've read and found other people uh, you know, researching how to build the observatory is if you have uh, uh, materials that are insulators that rather than conductors and storage, heat storage like a concrete or a block, concrete block construction for the building or having a concrete pad that stores heat energy in during the day and you don't really want it to come out at night and uh, obscure your, so basically what we did is we built, you know, we had a wooden deck above the grass area to build the observatory on. It's all wood construction. So the heat dissipation is very fast in the building. We've got, you know, the, the shutter open and we got windows on the side and the door open. It'll evacuate that heat pretty quickly when, when the sun goes down. Um, Yes, it goes through the deck. It's isolated on a concrete pier, 
Uh, and I'll, you'll see pictures of the pier here in a minute. So this is some various pictures. Uh, we'll go into these in detail. So you can see the pier there on the right uh, and some of the construction on the left. Uh, go ahead and go to the next. So this is, we built this in Myron's garage. It was, in, it was uh, December and it was cold outside and raining and stuff. So we took about a week and a half probably to gather the materials and then build it. And these are two views of it. The one on the uh, left is before we put the dome skirt on. And then you can see the dome skirt on the other, on the right hand side. But that's the pier that we started with uh, right there. Now, I'll get into this later, but we started out with the pier at that height, which is, you know, four feet, or yeah, about four and a half feet. Uh, but of course, the dome is up seven foot. That's a seven foot tall building. So, you know, you got your telescope down here, and it's, it's so it was restricted in the altitude it could come down to when we first started. So you'll see going forward what we did. So go to the next frame. Here's when we finished the building. This was right after uh, in uh, 2016, uh, in January of 2016. Uh, we, that's when we were finished up putting the dome up on the building. We haven't installed any of the instruments or anything. Um, so that's what it looks like. Um, and we got a full-size door. I don't know if I show another picture, but we got a full seven-foot size door. Now, one of the design requirements was we, we wanted to operate this remotely, but we also wanted to be able to get in there to change instruments to do other things in the building. So we, we, we decided to go ahead and make the full-size door. And you'll see in a minute how we configured the scope to be up in the dome um, so we could walk around underneath it. So it, it really feels like a big a big observatory when you're looking up at the instrument, you know, and seeing it. And then you have plenty of room underneath to walk around and store things and do that kind of thing. So go ahead and go to the next slide. It's a seven foot, it's a seven foot cube, basically. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's, um, yeah, it's about a seven foot cube. So this is what we did with the pier. We, so from January of 16 to April of 2016, we ran with the pier on the uh, left, and you can see the beefy wedge we had to put the uh, Mead telescope on. And then in April, we got this pier extension that we put on here. Uh, now, I was a little bit concerned about the vibration. If there was any, you know, that's a long beam, basically, from the concrete. It's got a heavy concrete pier or base that it bolts down into. You can see here where it bolts down. And it's isolated from the building. It's isolated from the deck. Uh, but there's three big concrete footings that go about three feet into the ground. Um, so it bolts to that and then extend it up here. And, but you can, you can bang it <coughs> up here. And it just it quickly dissipates. I mean, it's like, you know, it's just, it's just a slight movement. So it hasn't been an issue in our, in our astrophotography at all. Uh, and you can walk around and jump in the building, and it doesn't, it's isolated completely, uh, so it's not a big deal. But given that, it's still a remotely operated big, uh, system, so there's nobody in there typically anyway. Uh, so, but it's, it works uh, if it's manned or not. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Here's the computer system that we have in there. And you can see the Davis weather system and the dome controller on the right. Uh, actually, on both pictures, um, this is the dome controller. The dome work, digital dome works from Technical Innovations. This is the Davis Weather uh, Station, uh, and both of these, of course, talk to the computer to record data and to control it. Um, go ahead and go to the next. All right, here's some pictures of the uh, LX200, the 12-inch on there. Uh, we kind of rigged up some things. We were playing around with different configurations. That's one of the nice things, too, is you can, once you've built the facility, you can decide to change your instruments in and out. It takes, you know, maybe three hours to change an instrument or to get it configured, you know, depending on what you want to do. But you can see we had the QHY camera on the back of the, the LX200 with the uh, moonlight focuser. That's the blue focuser on this one um, right here. You can see a little bit of blue there. But 
the flexure problem was really racking us. You know, we really were getting frustrated with that mirror flop, basically, is what we figured out it was. Uh, and that's kind of why we sold the system. Now, this is the, uh, this shows the PMC-8 controller. And we strap everything to the pier, basically. You'll see in other pictures that just everything is bungeed to the pier. We got some cable management, and it works very well. I mean, it's, we didn't want to permanently set up something to bolt stuff to because we're configuring things. We're changing the configuration. We may change instruments. We may do other things. But this is a very flexible way to do it. Uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide. There's a close-up of the, of the uh, dome works. Um, a little bit more of the Lozmedy G11 mount. Uh, and this is just a, uh, you know, this is like a cup that, like, but that bolts onto the G11 tripod and then the mount slips into it. So we got this adapter that bolts in through one bolt into the, into the pier. And it's very, very sturdy. That thing won't move a bit when you bang on it. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So this shows a couple more instruments. This is the TDM Telescope Drive Master controller in the middle. There's the Moonlight Focuser we've got. Uh, the manual controller, you can, you can push the buttons manually if you want to move the focuser or use the computer. And you can see our Dell computer system with an uh, HD display on it. Uh, of course, that, the display gets turned off when we're not in there. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, here's a few more pictures. I think there's the GPS receiver. It's just got a magnetic back, so it just sits there right on the pier. Works great. Uh, we had this 66-millimeter, uh, um, what's the company that makes that scope? It's AstroTech with the, the ZWO camera on it. We were, had that as a finder at one point with the, uh, with the LX200 on there with the 12-inch. All right, so that's a close-up of the weather station. Go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so one of the, some of the things you need to think about when, you, when you're doing remote access, once you've got a building that's got your astronomical imaging system in there with everything working, you've run it from the local position, you, know, you can do everything you need to do, then you can think about remote access. Uh, and the main things you need to think about that's the difference between a local portable system and a uh, remote access system is you got to worry about power, uh, you got to worry about communications, and so how are you going to manage the power remote, uh, remotely and then how are you going to manage the communications and make sure you, you don't necessarily have to have redundant communications but it helps to understand where your failure points are and have kind of a good uh, thing and then facility protection and and any kind of downtime or spare parts that you run into. One of the things we found out with the 23-year-old uh, mead, the fork mount, the, uh, it had a, um, um, the controller on it failed on us twice. So we had to scramble for spare parts on the mount. So that's why we moved it off the fork into the, uh, under the G11. So we, we dealt with some spare parts issues and some things like that. Um, that causes your observatory to be down. Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, some things, you know, you're trying to get a nice sophisticated system, but you gotta simplify as much as you can. Try to minimize the number of connections, the number of uh, uh, pieces, parts. Um, and that's one reason we went with uh, Telescope Drive Master. Uh, having an auto guiding system is fine. You have an extra scope with a camera and the extra piece of software. Uh, but that's just one more level of complexity that you have to deal with when you're doing remote access and when you're trying to train on the system also to do imaging. Uh, so we, we wanted to do away with that subsystem, the whole auto guider thing. So that's why we went with the Telescope Drive Master. Uh, it just turns on and works. You don't have to think about it. One of the philosophies that Explore Scientific has is that we want, your, we want you to buy your equipment from us, but you, we want it to go away or disappear when you start to use it. We don't want you to have to think about it. You just want to you want to focus on your object that you're studying um, or photographing. Uh, so that's part of the thing you need to think about. Um, uh, power components, you know, you need 
Uh, if you want to have battery backup, you know, depending on how far away it is and how often you run it, you, you might want to consider battery UPS backup. You want to consider uh, lightning protection, any kind of lightning protection. If you have a way to disconnect your main power from the system completely and isolate the observatory so that it doesn't have a risk of lightning strike, then that's good. Um, having a web power management system is good. Having a so, it, but that's typically that's really separate from your primary access to the system, and I'll talk about that with TeamViewer. So you basically that's what's nice about this web uh, remote switch that we have. Uh, cabling, Ethernet cabling, routers, wireless. This we have an Ethernet network internal to the observatory, but we went with we went. Uh, Initially, we just had wireless into the observatory from uh, Myron's house, which worked pretty well. I wasn't the fastest in the world, but it, was, it worked better than I expected because the building is about 150 feet from his house. Uh, but we went with, uh, we were going to run some cabling to do Ethernet from the router in his house over to the facility. But uh, what we found, what I, what I decided is that, well, well, maybe we'll try one of these Ethernet over power line uh, devices, endpoints. So we're running our Ethernet uh, over the power line out to the observatory. So we've got one power line out to the observatory that carries both our communications and our power. So and that works very well. So I'm sure there's beefier ones you can buy, you know, more industrial strength power line uh, Ethernet adapters uh, that would really be robust for uh, something in the remote field. You know, that's it's 150 miles away from your house or 300 miles or whatever. Uh, so that's something to consider. We, we've run it pretty successfully. All right, next. Alan. <laughs> All right, this is just a couple of drawings from my book about what, what it looks like, the configuration. you got a power system layout. And then you've got some component layout with the system and, and the piece. So all within this box right here is basically your imaging system. This is what you would set up portable in the field and use locally. And then so that's an isolated box. And then you've got communications. And that's the big piece that turns it into a remote access system. Um, all right, next. Here's an example of a screen. Uh, this is We use TeamViewer which is an excellent free program that gives you a great uh, performance on a remote access. It's, it's, virtual, it's like you're sitting there at the observatory. I'm five miles away. I've got very good internet access and very high speed. But it's just like you're sitting there in the observatory. It's the same, same resolution, same performance. You know, it responds immediately when you type on it and you move your mouse around and stuff like that. But this is what a screen looks like when the, the uh, system is operating. All right, next. With the systems, is this similar? I think about the Davis being totally non-economical. How, how is all of that integrated so that you get all the information you need on the operating system? Oh, on the room. Go back to the previous screen. I've got the other screens, but I'll show you this real quick. So the two main programs we used are MaximDL, and cart to seal. Maxim DL is really the key to integrating all that information together into one screen. You can connect to all your devices. You can connect to the, the mount, the cameras, uh, the, uh, even the power switch. We don't have that operating now. The Davis weather system, the dome, all that stuff is controlled through Maxim DL. So you have all that information together on one screen. Uh, and it's called the observatory window. If you, and you can't really see it. But there's, there's all the different things here. And you can actually have a simple planetarium program and also that's on the screen from Maxim DL. But we use Cart to Seal as a more robust planetarium program to uh, navigate the telescope. Uh, you didn't have to do any heavy duty scripting. No, in fact, we've, we've kind of held off on that a little bit. I haven't really gotten into scripting so much because this is more of a training system also more hands-on. We want people to understand what it takes to really start up the system, all the different pieces, parts, what's involved with if they have an issue, how to troubleshoot it. So this allows you to manually 
It's just like you're sitting there locally, you know, you set up your portable system, you'll manually start the system up, you'll take your images, you'll watch your images come in. Now that's not to say that you can't, once you've got your target centered, you can, you can script, you can set the uh, imaging, um, there's a, um, what's it called? Um, it's an auto feature that you can set up a script for all your images, the times, the filters, everything, and it'll sit there and run through all your images uh, for hours, you know, depending on how many images you want and how, how much. Now, the p other piece of that script that we don't do right now is, is slewing to each object. But you could very easily in Maxim write a script to slew to an object, do a sequence of imaging, and then slew to another object. And one thing that Maxim does also is uh, we've got pinpoint uh, plate solve uh, program on there. Bob Denny wrote that, and it's integrated into Maxim so that every time you take an image, it automatically does a plate solve on it. And you can enable to where it would correct the position. As you take an image, it'll correct the, it'll resync the uh, mount to the image. So you always know where you're pointing at at that point. So that's the kind of integration you can do. Uh. Yeah, I mean, they update the program pretty regularly. Um, we're running version 6.15, uh, I think, is what we're running now. Um, but when you buy the license, you got you got free upgrades for however long the license period is, a year or two years. Uh, and then when they come out with a new version or a new major level, like if you go from 6 to 7, you'll probably, I don't know, I think you'd have to pay a little bit of a premium to upgrade to that license, but once you're on that level, like we're on level six right now, or version six, every version six that comes out is free, basically. Um, so that's how that works. Uh, so we'll get more into that. Um, so one thing I found, of course, I'm, my background is nuclear engineering, so I like to write things down and, and make notes and write procedures and things like that. But one thing when you're building your observatory, when you're, when you're configuring things and you're figuring out what to do, you need to write down what you do. And so that, not that so you don't repeat it again or so that you, but so that you learn from what, what happened with that configuration so you can try something else or troubleshoot the issue. Uh, if you have a problem, you know, well, there's something wrong with that configuration or that, the way I did that. So making notes uh, on the configuration and the design is very, very important in that regard. Um, also, uh, if you do minor changes, you know, you're stable, you got a stable configuration and you're doing minor changes, maybe you're changing the setting on a, on a camera setting for, uh, like the gain and offset maybe, or you're doing other things like that on your imaging or on the configuration of your mount controller. Write it down and keep up so that when the next time you do a, an upgrade, if you change something out, you can see, well, where was I at with this? And then you can put it back in or you can make sure it, it stays the same. Um, and then use remote control applications such as TeamViewer, um, like I talked. So we'll get more into that too. So go to the next. Uh, so this is, a, this is a picture of the webcam. Uh, it's a close-up of the instrument over the webcam. The, the webcam shows a wide-angle view, typically, but you can, you can set the region of interest on the camera, of course, and move it around so you can see different pieces of the, of the dome, which is kind of nice. Uh, so that just gives you an example of what the desktop looks like with the webcam um, tab selected on, on the uh, Maxim DL. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, so here's another picture from, uh, from the same location as the webcam. I, lent, I bent down and took a picture uh, with my camera. So that's kind of what you see with the webcam. So as an example. Uh, and so that's the, do you have any questions about the uh, construction design of the facility? The MSR facility is managed by a private, it's by uh, the MSRO commission. It's not Explore Scientific's facility. So, no. Could I get into issues with that? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. No, it's not, uh, it's MSRO, it's not Explore Scientific yeah. Facility. We have uh, on the Rappahannock Astronomy Club website, there's a page for the MSRO, it's, and it's rackclub.org. I think I listed it on here later. But if you go to rackclub.org and click on the MSRO link on the right-hand side, you'll come up with the page for the observatory. And at the bottom, there's a uh, way to download an uh, observation request form. And there's different ways, there's different levels of user. One is a guest user, where if you just want to see how it works and try it out, you can fill out a request and say, yeah, I want to see how this works. And then we'll walk you through if you want to get on it, or if you either want to request an image be done and we just send it to you, you don't want to be involved with getting on the system. Or if you want to get on a system and download TeamViewer to your laptop or computer and use it with us, doing the work, you can watch what we do as we take your images, you can do that. That would be a guest user. And then there's a training user, which is training to use the observatory. Um, you know, they'll get, they'll get training through TeamViewer online. I'm also starting to create some videos that I've got one out on YouTube now that tells you how to start up the MSRO, steps through the screens and how, it, how it's done. Uh, but if you're a trainee, then you would um, put that on the request and say, yeah, I'm interested in learning how to use this observatory. And then we would talk to you and get you configured. And then the, then the, other, the third one is, of course, a full observer that has full rights to the observatory uh, to get on there by themselves and use the system. And that's, we've got um, three people like that right now. All right, any more? Yeah. Right, right. And, you know, I knew it would really be terrific with you know, the, the better mouse I could screw up. So I decided to try this on Orion mouse. I was stunned. Mm -hmm. Stunned. So I just can imagine we just miss, let's take those better quality mouse. Oh, yeah. Like, you know. Yeah, well. This system on the G11, we we can do 10-minute subs pretty easily. We've got a very good, we've got a very good, uh, right? We got a very good uh, polar alignment. It took a couple of sessions to get that, but once we got that, and we're limited to sky, where we're located is what we are. We typically do five-minute subs, is you know typical. Uh, when I do my asteroid work, I probably do one-minute subs because the asteroids move, you know, pretty quick. So you want to do an accurate measurement. So you, so I limit my, I maybe do a two-minute subframe for asteroids, but it's typically one minute. But it does um, great, great for science work, you know. And I don't want to say that's what it's designed for, but it, uh, it supports that very well. Beautiful pictures are uh, a little harder to do because you're so, you want to get such performance that the stars have, you know, people like to do 20-minute subs and 30-minute subs with narrowband filters. Uh, with our, we haven't really attempted that with that s the system so far. But we can, we can try it. Yeah, yeah. But we get less than one arc second RMS uh, PE with the telescope drive master on the G11. And that's when it's carried, that's with the 12-inch uh, LX200 with 45 pounds of instruments on the, on the G11, which is pushing it. You know, so. Uh, oh, I, with the six inch, we get, uh, I've done 17 and a half, almost 18, 18th magnitude. Uh, I can, I've been able to detect, you know, really low signal to noise ratio, a little over 18. With the 12 inch mead, it was better, but it really wasn't, as better as, as what you would expect based on the uh, objective size, you know, the size of the mirror and the difference. It, it, we were getting, I think uh, uh, we were able to detect with one minute exposures like uh, 19th, 
19th magnitude, eight, you know, over 18, pretty consistently. But with the Mead 12 inch. Now, there's a difference too between, you know, that QHY camera is a nice modern high QE camera. It's like 80% Q, uh, QE on that camera. Uh, the SBIG 2000 is pretty good. I mean, so we, we probably gain a half a magnitude with a QHY camera. All right, so that'll get us into, is there any more questions on that, on the construction? That'll get us into some of the observing programs that you can do with the MSR remotely. Uh, of course, these are the major measurements that you can do, astrometry measurements for uh, you know minor planet position and binary star orbit measurements if you're into binary stars. Um, photometry, which is a big thing, so again, Minor planet magnitudes, uh, light curves is a big thing uh, for variable stars and for minor planets. And and one thing I took a, a course from the uh, AVSO on exoplanet observing, so I'm hoping to be able to do some exoplanet work with the system. We we can do some spectroscopy because we've got that filter grading, the 200 line per millimeter filter grading, uh, which is very nice. Uh, you can do basic stellar type uh, classification and temperature measurements. And uh, one thing you can do for stellar type, which is pretty, is a supernova type classification. You can do that kind of work. We haven't done any of that, um, but that's something that's possible. Uh, and then I'm into high resolution lunar and planetary imaging. That's the other camera we have. I've got a, um, a Point Grey Flea 3 camera. That's a gig -y, uh, gigabyte Ethernet uh, camera that I use to do high-resolution imaging on the lunar planetary imaging. Uh, so you have to change the instrument out. You know, when it gets to be, you know, after after uh, near first quarter, probably a three or four day old moon, I I go out and change the camera to the video camera. We've got it right there available to just swap. You know, pull the hand camera out and put the other one in. And right now with the SBIG 2000, we have a 0.7 uh, focal reducer on the system. Uh, so it's actually a, a six inch F5.6 uh, system, the way it's configured for deep sky work. And then when we put the, uh, um, I put a Barlow on the video camera for the lunar stuff and it's, and two times Barlow is typical I can sometimes, I got a four times power mate I can put on there, but the two times Barlow, it's a uh, F-16 system uh, with, with, you know, with our seeing and everything else with our, our conditions that we have. That, that does a good job of getting pretty good lunar images. And I'll have some examples here. And then you can do also, uh, I, I do measurements on my lunar images with a program called Lunar Terminator Visualization Tool. Have you all heard that, LTVT? It's a very nice tool to do measurements on your lunar images. You, it takes and measures uh, the shadows and calculates the heights of the mountains and the, and the rim heights and stuff like that. And you can measure crater diameters and things like that and correct for views. You can, you can uh, basically it allows you to map an image onto a sphere that's you know like the moon and you can rotate it around to do. So if you've got something near the limb and you want to see what it really looks like, you can, in the computer, you can rotate it around and see an aerial view of the lunar image of the, the craters. It's a pretty cool s uh, a tool, and I use that a lot uh, for stuff that I do for ALPO. All right, next. So here's an example of a file that I sent to the Minor Planet Center in March uh, for some measurements I did, uh, 16 different minor planets in an evening. Um, and I got down to magnitudes, there you go, 18. And this is with the um, six inch. <coughs> now the signal to noise ratio wasn't very high, but I was able to measure the position pretty accurately. Um, and the residual error on the measurement is uh, like 0.1 arc second or maybe a little bit more depending on the 
measurement. So, all right, next. Yeah. Yeah, using, using no, we're, I'm, I'm taking the image, doing a plate solve, right? And then I'm doing astrometric to measure the position of the, of the minor planet based on that plate solve. Yeah, I, I use uh, I use two catalogs. That's a good question. I use a UCAC four catalog, which is the U.S. Naval Observatory catalog. Um, the previous one, and then they have the new one is a U is called the URAT one. Uh, it's their new catalog that I download. It's a huge catalog. It's I'm trying to think. It's like over 100 gigabytes of data in this catalog. But um, but I downloaded it and use it to, s to do plate solves also and to do measurements. It's very accurate uh, measurements, um, minor planets. Yes. Oh, that's the other thing with the focal reducer on here. The field is, I didn't provide any, I get, get, I've got CCD inspector to measure the field flatness on the images, but I didn't include any of those pictures. But the field with the field focal reducer is absolutely flat uh, within a few percent. Uh, so there's no, you know, there's really no distortion. The residual, the error due to the, the field being, the flatness of the field is very small amount. I think most of the error is just due to the noise in the image. Um, all right, so here's an example of, this is the full frame of the QHY5 163 camera, and, and you can see half this little, Nebula in here, Hafner 18. Uh, Myron actually took this picture, and there's a close-up of it. This is a full-resolution view of the image, and you can see the stars are pretty round. <coughs> I mean, I don't know if they're as perfect as some people would want, but they're plenty round for me for doing measurements, and they look nice. And you can see how big a field of view it is uh, with that camera. All right, next. <coughs> yep. Here's the Great Hercules Cluster. Uh, and again, I got to blow up so you can see the detail in the image and how around the stars. And some of the distortion in the stars, I've noticed this, is some, some stars look very perfectly round and other ones look a little, little different. I think part of it is the seeing that goes on in our skies. The seeing we have is not, it's not great. It's it's mediocre to, to good. You know, it's typically around three arc seconds. We can sometimes get two and a half to two arc seconds, but that's very rare. So I think that's part of what we're dealing with here. And the thing is also, we'll, we'll image every clear night that we can, regardless of the scene. We'll get, the, we'll get on the instrument and, and do some imaging. We'll just do it. I mean, because it's hard to turn down a clear night when you've got a, a remote observatory that you can start up in five minutes and start playing with, you know, it's like, <laughs> why not, you know. So that's an example of the M13. And this is a, I'm trying to think how long this exposure is. I think it's at least two hours. It may be longer. All right, next. Here's a Trifid Nebula I did. Uh, this is a close-up of the image. I don't, actually, that's a crop of that QHY camera. The, uh, if the original image was the same size as this, it's probably multiplied by about four. So the Trifid would be about this big within the full image. But this is a, this is a full resolution image. So you, again, you can see the stars, how round they are. And the color on that QHY camera is really perfect. I didn't do any color adjustment. I did a, 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 a background uh, balance, a white balance on the background is all I did. And you can see the colors. Pretty accurate. Uh, all right. Yeah, it's a one-shot color. Yep. Yep. And here's the Lagoon Nebula. I was messing with the colors here, so I don't know. I'm not a deep sky imager. Let me put that up front. I'm not a color imager. I just did this because they were the targets were available, and I was just testing to see what we could do. So I'm sure there's a lot of people that's much better than I am. Uh, so I don't know if these colors are right. I was just playing with it. Uh, so, but you can see the difference in out here in the internal, you know, structure and the external. So, that's kind of what you can see. Uh, and you can see how nice and sharp the stars are. 
All right, next. Uh, here's M81. This is another, I think this is like a test, another test exposure that I was doing, just playing with. The colors are a little more subtle. Uh, yes, these are five-minute subframes. I, I'm, I'd have to go back and look at the file to see what the total exposures are, but they're typically around an hour to two hours. Um, so, all right, next. M51. Uh, this is a four-hour uh, total exposure, five-minute subframes. Uh, all right, next. A, this is a monochrome M M1 with the, uh, that's just luminance on the ST2000 camera. Uh, that was an early image we took. I think this was taken with the 12-inch Mead. All right, next. Here's another horse head, uh, or the horse head 30-minute unguided. This is unguided on the G11 without the telescope drive master with um, 60 second subframes, 30, 60 second subframes. It's not bad. That's with the 12 inch. All right, next. There's another one, 20 minute. That's what the, S you can see the image scale on ST2000 camera is much bigger. So, but this is zoomed up too, so you can see how nice it is. All right, next. The, the stars were a little blobby there. You see that. <laughs> and here's the M104. Same thing with the, uh, this is a color image. You can see a little bit of, I didn't have a flat field. You can see some. I think this is readout noise. Yeah, heat, heat. Yeah, thermal. All right, next. All right, so this is this is an example of Astrometrica. I'm doing a measurement on an asteroid. I think it's pronounced uh, Uena 379, and this is just an example of the plate solve. Um, all right, next. Here's a couple of minor planets. Th these are you can tell these are test frames because they got uh, they're messy and all, but you can see this is a stack showing uh, asteroid Lynn and then Irene. You can see how much brighter Irene is. It's, it's asteroid 14. It's a big asteroid. Um, but I got those together. But these are the kind of science images that we have that, um, you know, they're perfectly good for doing photometric measurements once you calibrate them. Um, all right, next. All right, here's, an, here's another minor planet measurement. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but this, little, this is where the asteroid is, this little box. It's uh, asteroid 11751. It's a, it's a fairly, it's from 1999 is when it was discovered, but this is the Astrometrica. It allows you to, to do the plate solve, and then you select the object, and then it, it'll measure the centroid and then tell you what the magnitude is and then what the position is uh, and that's what you record to send to the Minor Planet Center and it uses the uh, either I'm using the URAT1 database it's listed here alright next alright here's some of the lunar images I did uh, and this wasn't even the best this is w not even using uh, uh, I think I, I still had I didn't put the Barlow on it still had the .7 or no, it was just the straight uh, prime uh, mounting on the camera. So it had a F8 is what it was. But you can see the detail you can get with the image. And I thought it was very interesting because right here, this crater, Bessel G, that's one mile crater. You can detect it. You can see it right there, that white spot. That's the crater. It's a one mile diameter crater with an F8. So that's, that's pretty cool. All right, next. Uh, here's some of the LTVT measurements that I did on uh, this crater, Trisneca, Necker, up top there. And uh, you can see you can 
it's kind of neat being able to measure the shadow lengths and calculate the, the height of the rim and also some peak like these peak heights here like along here um, that's kind of cool so that's the kind of stuff you can do with lunar images No, that's the image we took. And, then and this is a blow up of it. That's a blow up of the upper section. Yep. All right, here's an example of a spectra with the grading. Uh, it's beta Leo spectra. And I don't know if you can see it, but this is the uh, zero order. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have any idea what time it was. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's fine. All right. So let's go ahead into the next one. So, so that's an example of the spectra. And that's just with maxim. You can do a graph. Go ahead into the next one. Here's a spectra, high resolution spectra we took. The uh, red is the spectra we measured, the blue is the reference. And it matches pretty close, and we can, you can see where we measured oxygen uh, uh, peaks or attenuation in the oxygen. All right, go to the next. All right, here's another example of another star. Go ahead and go to the next. All right, that's it. No, no, that's fine. I, I had a lot of slides, and I, you know, I get into explanation and things. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. I appreciate that. No, that's fine. Thank you. Hope you found it uh, interesting. Yeah, I didn't realize what time.